Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Today we're joined by our colleague Michael Tanner, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and author of the new book, Going for Broke, Deficits, Debt, and the Entitlement Crisis. Greece is in the news right now because they're having their own sort of crisis. And is that where we're ending up? I mean your book is things look pretty bad and we're spending way more money than we have and it's going to be hard to reform it. Are we on the road to Greece? Well, I think you can overstate that premise because there are some significant differences between us and Greece. Uh, we're a much bigger economy which gives us more room for error. Uh, we owe most of our debt internally whereas Greece owed it to foreign creditors who could therefore have a lot more claim over them. And most importantly of all, we control our own currency, whereas the Greeks uh, are basically in hock to the European Central Bank. Uh, if nothing else, we can always devalue the currency and inflate our way out of debt, uh, uh, which is something the Greeks don't have the ability to do. Uh, we're not as export-based as an economy and so on. So there's, so there's differences. But if you look at the underlying problems, the, the, the thing that basically got Greece where it was – uh, we do seem to be going down along the same trail. Uh, they, of course, have run up uh, unsustainable amounts of debt and particularly debt for dealing with things like their pension and health care systems. We're very much in the same boat. Uh, we already owe 101 percent of GDP, which <clears throat> means we owe more than the value of all the goods and services you produce in the country over the course of a year. It's sort of like as if your credit card uh, bills were bigger than your entire salary pre-tax. Uh, you'd have a problem. Uh, they have a government that's growing, uh, that's in more intrusive and uh, just kind of a heavier burden on their economy. We're nowhere near where Greece is, but the CBO projects that we could well end up there by mid-century. And, uh, and finally, they, uh, they have a business climate that really is too regulatory, too strict, which is making it very difficult for economic growth in their country. And we're seeing growth in regulations and taxation in this country that, uh, that also puts a burden on business and slows economic growth. We're not getting anywhere near the post-war average growth that we uh, used to see. Now, libertarians and conservatives have been writing about the debt for a very long time. Uh, the coming fiscal train wreck is almost boilerplate for libertarians and conservatives. I remember when Aaron and I were, were setting up the Cato Institute Library, we had a special section of books we were setting aside that were saying, the collapse of 1984, the collapse of 1987, the coming collapse of 1995. Uh, what's different? Is there anything different this time? Have we just been kicking some can down the road or is there something worse now than there was before the last 20 books that were written about this? Well, I think it's worse in the sense that our debt is bigger. Uh, I mean I do think that uh, there were people, myself included, who sort of underestimated the resilience of the American economy and, and thought that we would hit the, the wall before we did. Uh, but I think it's still out there. In fact, they asked the head of the Congressional Budget Office last uh, – about two weeks ago whether or not he thought there was a Greek-style crisis coming or when that would hit. And he basically said, we just don't know. Uh, it could hit. It could not. If it comes, we don't know when it is. There's some point that you simply can't sustain this amount of debt. You know, the old saying that that which cannot go on forever eventually stops. Well, uh, you know, we just don't know when it's going to stop. Something I'm curious about with this debt and you mentioned it in passing. I mean, your answer to the last question, you said that unlike Greece, we – a lot of the debt that we have, we owe to ourselves. How does that work? I mean, how is that even really debt? Like is it, is it different from I could take money out of one of my pockets and put it in the other? Or um, borrow but from your wife. If you borrow from your wife, are you just in debt to it's, But it's all family. from the same it's bank account. Family, right. Yeah. So is it – to talk about it as debt but we owe it to ourselves, something doesn't make sense there. Sure. Well, and that's, uh, that's always sort of been the Keynesian uh, approach to this. Uh, in one sense, when I say we owe it to ourselves, I mean we don't owe it to external creditors. About 60 percent of our debt is held by Americans. If you have a 401k or a pension fund that buys government bonds, you owe part of the – own part of the American debt. Uh, if you have a savings bond, I mean that's, part, that's American debt. Uh, so so the, in that sense, it's different than the Greeks where their debt is held by basically German banks uh, or the, the IMF and the European Central Bank. Uh, now, what the question, larger question economically about whether we owe it to ourselves, there is a sense in which you can owe debt to yourselves, yourself and sort of pay it back. And I'm th trying to think – I'm thinking in terms of, for example, if you as a household were to go into debt so that you could go to college and therefore earn a higher salary in the future when that debt comes due and pay it back, you're actually better off run running that debt. 
Uh, but most of what we spend money on in this country is not that type of investment. If the U.S. were to say borrow money or like states do, they would issue a bond and then they build the roads and bridges and that theoretically increases economic growth in their state and they can pay it back with that. If the U.S. ran debt for that purpose, you could have an argument about whether or not they achieved that goal but it, it would be an understandable economic point. The problem is that only about 13 percent of all federal spending is considered investment spending and that's even a broad definition of investment that includes human resource capital like uh, education spending. Consider, Mo- considered by who investment spending? By economists. CBO? Uh, economists. economists. Okay. By most economists. I mean it, most of it – and it, I don't think there's much dispute on it. Most of it is transfer payments. It is simply taking money from one person and giving it to another and that does nothing to, to build economic growth for the future and make it easier to pay that money back. And in a sense, of course, we don't just owe it to ourselves. What we do is we owe it to future generations, which are not necessarily going to be the same people who are collecting the benefit of the consumers now. Uh, in your family, it's a little bit like if you ran up your credit card b- bills right now uh, to go on a great vacation and you get to consume that vacation and have a great time and then uh, you just leave that credit card bill for when you die so your kids will pay it off. Uh, so it's not that's, really that's ourselves. That's not really ourselves. Well, the Greeks I'm sure are pretty – or the, maybe the younger Greeks are somewhat mad at the – older generation of Greeks and the next generation might be angry too. So they're all Greeks but they're not the same people. You would think so although in the recent vote to turn down the uh, the EU offer, actually younger Greeks were more likely to vote against the the debt uh, deal than, than the older Greeks. Uh, it's because they want in on the – on yeah, the goodies I, everyone else had. Precisely. And they were afraid that they were going to get cut off before you before you got there, that the gravy train was going to stop and then of course they've known they've been paying. Also, it's worth noting that the Greek so-called austerity had, didn't have a lot to do with cutting benefits. It had a lot to do with raising taxes and it was going to be those young Greeks that had to pay that. But So if these entitlements, these entitlements cost us money, which is what – how we run up the debt because we're spending it. But if a large portion of the entitlement spending is transfer payments, then we're taking the money out of the economy in the form of taxes or borrowing it from future Americans but then we're turning right around and giving it back to – Americans, right? We're giving – Social Security is handing people checks and Medicare Medicaid is paying for their health bills. So how is this ending up spending the money as opposed to just cycling it around within the U.S. economy? Well, as much as anything, it is just cycling it, it around within the U.S. economy. The problem comes down in the future to the point where what you're spending in terms of benefits is less than the amount you're taking out of the economy in terms of taxes. Uh, we ran about a $65 billion or so shortfall in Social Security this year and it's just never going to get any better. Every year after that, it's going to get larger and larger. Uh, overall, uh, we owe some $25 trillion in future benefits that the tax revenue is not expected to pay. So that's money you have to borrow in effect to keep paying those benefits. If it was just ta- tax it and give it to someone else, you have a lot of efficiency loss. You, you could argue about dead weight losses and, and things like that. But, it's, but essentially, that would just be kind of moving it around the economy. Wouldn't do anything to gain growth. It's just redistribution. But, uh, but it's not as bad as, as where we're going to go. Now, you mentioned uh, the, the term a few minutes ago, hitting the wall. Like when, when we're going to hit the wall, when does it collapse? What does hitting the wall look like? Does it look like Greece or does it who, – who knows exactly? What is it – what will we know when we've hit the wall? Well, some degree that it, we don't know uh, what it will look like and to some degree it depends on whether we not start making changes now that are going to enable us to make a soft landing in the future or whether we're going to just go up to the cliff and, and sort of fall off it. What it will mean is that we will either not be able to pay the benefits that are promised and there will be people who suddenly find out they can't get – they're not going to get a check or their check will be 75 percent of what they thought it was going to be for Social Security, for example, and be in real trouble if that's what they were relying on in retirement. Or it will be that we'll continue to pay those benefits because after all, seniors vote and we won't pay for anything else. Uh, you know, by mid-century, we'll be in a position in which essentially Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid and interest on the debt consume every penny in taxes. Uh, so there basically would be no money for anything else the federal government does. Uh, it, it kind of always amazed me that uh, folks on the left were such ardent defenders of these uh, social insurance programs like Social Security and Medicare because they're ultimately squeezing out all the other things the left would like to do, uh, ed- education, child care, uh, social welfare spending. That, that's all going to go away. We're going to be a country that does nothing but mail checks to old people. But isn't that just because the wealthy and corporations aren't paying their fair share? I mean we could cover all this if we just taxed people what – would be reasonable. Unfortunately, there's just not enough rich people out there to, to pay for it or, or fortunately depending on how you want to look at it. 
I mean, the reality is if you didn't just raise taxes a little bit on Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, if you, if you actually went out and confiscated every penny that was owned by everybody who earned a million dollars or more last year, so just took all the millionaires and billionaires and took it all, which you could only do once as far as I know, uh, you still wouldn't get enough to pay off the national debt, let alone enough to pay all the future unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare. Uh, what you really would have to do is raise taxes enormously on the middle class uh, in order to uh, in order to get there, and frankly, the middle class isn't going to do that. But doesn't that work? I mean, isn't there some sustainability in Scandinavian welfare state? Or so, there's something out there. We, we we can always sit here and sort of hyperbolically say that the welfare state is unsustainable, but it doesn't seem that way across the border. Are all these going to teeter on the edge and jump off a cliff eventually? Well, all of them are either going to teeter on the edge or they're going to make reforms. And in fact, many of the Scandinavian countries have already making reforms. Now, you can sort of set aside Norway, which is sitting on a sea of oil and, and, and sort of like the Saudi Arabia of northern Europe. And that sort of allows them to get away with a lot of things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But Sweden, for example, has begun reforming its system. It has drastically reduced uh, government as a percentage of its GDP. Uh, it has partially privatized its social security pension system. Uh, it has made a number of reforms uh, designed to move people from welfare to work, for example. So it, it, it is they are beginning to make changes in their social welfare system to bring their country back into line. And, and you know, they're still much bigger than us. They're still about 50 percent of GDP that their government spends. But they were close to 70 percent and not so long ago. Before we turn to the specifics of Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, are the problems that we're talking about just the nature of entitlement programs in and of themselves? I mean is there – is it ultimately like there's just something wrong with having entitlement programs to begin with or is what's wrong that we just haven't done them the right way? Well, I think there's two big problems with them. One is sort of something you can't get away from and that's the demographics. Uh, the fact is that uh, as a society, we're aging. Uh, we have more and more people who are in retirement collecting benefits for longer and longer periods of time. And we're also having fewer babies, which means there's going to be fewer people to support those retirees. And those are parts of long-term trends that really aren't going to change. Uh, I mean the, the health care, the, the fact that we have medical breakthroughs and stuff like that. Uh, it's always been said if you know the day we come up with a cure for cancer, everyone celebrates except the treasury secretary who kills himself. I mean it's, uh, it, it's going to be a very tough situation if people start living another 10 years longer than they do now. How, how are we going to pay them? So those dim and on the other side of it, the fewer babies, women are waiting, are going to workforce now. They're going to college. They're waiting a lot longer to have babies. The average age at which a woman has a baby, I think, has gone up about three years in the last couple of decades. Those things are, are not going to turn around. Uh, so we're going to be stuck with this demographic problem in the future. On the other side of it, the problem is that there's no real link between inputs and outputs on these entitlement programs. The the contributions you make or the taxes you pay are not directly related to the amount of benefits that you get out of the program. And that, that means there's always an incentive to increase benefits, to push benefits up and to minimize the amount of payment into the program. You, you want to keep the taxes low and the benefits high. Uh, so the, it, in many ways, it kind of runs like a Ponzi scheme, if you will. Uh, and the people at the top are, are big winners and they demand more and the people at the bottom have to pay. The difference, of course, is that uh, Ponzi didn't have a gun. Uh, he, he, you know, he, uh, he couldn't force people to keep contributing and the government could kind of keep making young people pay more and more, uh, at least for the time being. Well, that's that sort of brings up the Social Security question because Social Security is often called a Ponzi scheme, and as you said, maybe it's one that works if it is a Ponzi scheme. Maybe it's one that works because he has a gun uh, in, in the situation that we can just keep rolling it forward. We can always be in debt to future generations. I mean some amount of debt, debt is sustainable, I would imagine. Uh, and so in the na a national government is a better prospect for debt and the U.S. is a better prospect for debt than other countries. So we could have some debt and we could keep rolling it forward and they have the power of the gun. So what's the problem with Social Security? Yeah, I think Paul Samuelson is quoted as once as saying that Social Security is the best Ponzi scheme ever invented uh, because it works. Uh, and I mean one of the things people have to realize I think with Social Security is that when they pay their Social Security taxes, none of that money is saved for their retirement. Uh, people always write to me. I get all these emails uh, telling me that I paid into the Social Security system. I'm just getting my money back. Well, no, you're not. Uh, when you pay in, that money immediately goes out to pay for people who are already retired. 
Uh, just like in the pyramid scheme, when you pay, you give the money to the, the guy who's running the scheme. He uses it to pay for people who are vested above you or earlier than you. That's the same way Social Security works. And that you then hope that when you retire, there'll be another generation that comes along behind you that will then pay into the system and support you. And that works really well when you only have you know, at the top tip of the pyramid. You have only a few people receiving benefits and you have a lot of people who are paying in and getting the benefits. But if you go back in 1950, you had that situation. You had uh, 26 people, I believe, paying in for every person who was retired. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, now, unfortunately, we're down to about three now and it's going to continue down to slightly less than two uh, in the future. And that's a, that's a big burden on those two people who have to pay all the taxes in order to support those benefits. I'm curious about the history of how Social Security came to be, particularly in light of – I mean, yes, these demographic trends that you know, longevity and whatnot have accelerated, but were those trends visible at the time that people were proposing Social Security? Because it seems once you recognize that, you recognize that people are getting older and that as we get wealthier, we have fewer kids. It seems obvious that this system – once put in place, could not be meaningfully sustainable. So was that a conversation at the time when Social Security was first proposed? Was it, was it intended to last as long as it did? I think it was pretty much intended to be permanent. I mean Roosevelt famously said that the reason they used a payroll tax and this idea of contrib contributing to Social Security was that so no one could ever touch it in the, in the future. Uh, it's worth noting that Social Security was originally very small. The, the original tax was 1 percent on the employer, 1 percent on the employee to a maximum of $60. Uh, so I mean even accounting for inflation, that was a very small tax and the benefits were fairly, fairly low. It was intended not to be as a substitute for retirement benefits, to take care of you in retirement. It was supposed to, supposed to be something that was sort of on top of your retirement to kind of make sure that people didn't fall into poverty. And it was done under sort of an enormous, uh, very difficult circumstances in the United States, a very rare circumstance. We had just had the Great Depression. And if you look at it, there was a number of things that were happening at the time. Number one is the people couldn't rely on their savings because the banks were closed and their savings had been wiped out. And they couldn't rely on working because many of them were out of work. We had one-third uh, unemployment at the time. Nor could they necessarily rely on their children to take care of them because their children were out of work. And poor. So you had a real problem that was being taken place and I think, I think drove it. And of course, this was a – go back all the way to its origin. Social Security was originally a Bismarck idea uh, out of Prussia uh, in the uh, 1880s or so. Uh, I mean and it was done essentially as a trade-off to social democrats to get their support uh, for the war with France and so on. So the, it, it, I don't think it was ever thought of to be the structure it is today. Well, you also write in the book, which I had never heard before, that it didn't originally apply to government workers or farm workers, I think, or non people for sure. nonprofits. A very weird assortment of people that it didn't apply to. It was originally manufacturing workers, essentially. It was designed to be laborers in the factories. Uh, I mean, everyone else was assumed to be able to take care of themselves. I mean, farmers were thought to live with their families and they could always grow crops and so on. So it really took a lot of them out. And then it also didn't include household help and things like that who were largely minorities and blacks and they were not considered part of the general population uh, in, in the Roosevelt years and stuff. So they were excluded. So yeah, it had a very narrow focus and it was gradually added. It also didn't include disability benefits or survivors benefits originally and they've been added to the program since then. Is that sort of a predictable train of increasing the government program? Does this always happen? Because now we have SSRIs like for the uh, disability payments and SSDI and all these other sort of things. Is it just sort of do we always find that they keep getting bigger and bigger? Yeah, I mean exactly. I mean the natural extension of these programs is that they, they grow. I mean it just seems to be something about government that you know – if it's, if it's even a modest success, we figure it can do that much more. And if it's a failure, we figure we haven't spent enough money on it. So we, we try to spend more on that. I, w I will mention just in terms of the programs, SSI, which a lot of people sort of conflate with Social Security. We, should, we need to be careful of that one. Uh, it is a terrible program. It's perhaps one of the most fraud-ridden programs in government and there's a lot of reasons to criticize it. It is run by the Social Security Administration but it is not part of the Social Security system. It's not funded through the Social Security tax. Uh, in fact, uh, into the uh, – I think around 1980. I could be wrong on that date. But it was funded actually at the state level. And then they said, well, but the federal government is so good at mailing out checks. Uh, the Social Security Administration knows nothing. It knows how to print a check and mail it if nothing else. Why don't we put it in there? And so uh, so it's just sort, sort of an illusion. Of took it over. That's right. Okay. One of the weird things – I mean Social Security is supposed to be insurance against poverty and old age. I mean which it seems like a, a laudable thing. We don't want – are old people dying on the street or not being able to afford heat or air conditioning? You know, I mean, this is 
sure, this is good. But so one of the things that we talk about though when we're talking about offering up reforms is that Social Security goes to a lot of people who don't need it, that everybody gets Social Security. How did we get – I mean how do we get there? It seems, it seems obvious that yes, if we have an insurance just like Medicaid, you know, if you can't afford health insurance, we'll help you out. But if you can – like Warren Buffett should not get social security. Right. Yeah. So is that how substantial of a part of this debt that we're in is the result of that? And if and how why can't we fix that? That seems like an obvious fix. It, it's not a huge part in terms of dollars. I mean, yeah. there's just not enough Warren Buffetts and Bill Gates out there collecting their social security that's going to make a make a big difference. You'd actually have to means test it at a very low level. Uh, means testing is quite popular. Interestingly, if if you go to the public, they actually support means testing. As long as it's done at the dollar amount immediately below whatever their income is. <laughs> uh, Which actually says something about the theme in yeah, general. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think <laughs> don't touch my benefits but if you want to take Warren Buffett's away, that's fine. And, and, and Warren and, Buffett says you can take the guy above me but that, there's, no, always, there's no one there. It always works so. there. Um, economists worry about it for a couple of reasons, uh, the means testing. One is that you create a dis disincentive to save on your own. Why should I save on my own if it means they're going to take away my social security? Now, it's probably not going to affect millionaires. They're going to do what they want. But people who are in that middle range – Deciding whether they're going to put a little money, more money in their 401k or take that vacation this year. Well, you know, if it makes the, it's going to make the difference whether I get Social Security or not, the vacation looks that much better. The second is income doesn't always matter in retirement. It's assets and uh, how much you've accumulated, things like that. So you'd actually have to have not an income test but a, an asset test and that becomes very hard to do. How do you value stock options? How, how do you know a house? Is it you know is it the book value and what happens when they go down like we just had in the in the last recession and so on? So I, I think you've got to. It's something that's popular, but much more difficult to put in practice. I've had some of my uh, Democrat and and other uh, friends who support Social Security say that one reason they're against means testing, which does seem like Aaron said a very obvious thing to do, is because even cracking open Social Security and start asking the question about who deserves it and who doesn't deserve it, at what level, and will put questions on the table that, that they don't want to be on the table at all. Yeah, that's ARP's position. The AARP uh, has taken that position for a long time that they oppose any sort of means testing. Their argument is that it needs to be a universal program because that's what generates universal support. The, the phrase is poor – programs for the poor are poor programs. That if this becomes a means-tested program that we only see poor people taking advantage of, there will be a move to, un, to disfund it, to unfund it because we don't like programs for the poor. But this is universal. Mom and dad get it. So we all like it. Yeah, that seems like a, again part of the public choice analysis of the support of these programs and why they keep going forward. So I guess then on on Social Security, we've partly answered this, but how bad are things specifically for Social Security? And then what are the possibilities for reform on that? Sure. Well, we we can generally estimate the the shortfall in the future of Social Security and do it fairly accurately because. It's really just math. I mean, we know how many people will be retired in a given year in the future within a certain range. Uh, we know what the law says their benefits should be. We also know roughly what we'll be taking in in taxes in the future, assuming different economic growth scenarios and stuff. And you can find the gap between them. And right now, that gap is twenty-five trillion dollars, give or take. Uh, now, that's for all the accounting nerds out there. That's a discounted present value over the infinite horizon, which which essentially means that if we had twenty five million or a bit trillion right now, and we stuck it in the bank and it earned a three percent interest rate, then it would pay for the benefits for Social Security forever. Interesting. So, so there's no like by twenty fifty. That this is going to be a twenty-five trillion dollar gap. Oh, sure, you can you can do the debt in each each year. The um, the argument becomes well, you dollar amounts don't matter as much in the future. You'd have to discount the, what the dollar is worth in the future because it's better to have a dollar today than than it is tomorrow. That's why banks lend you money and and, and so on. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be within about ten years. It's about two to three hundred billion dollars. It's about sixty-five billion dollars right now. And it is the biggest part of the budget, correct? The Social Security. Is Social Security the is about twenty-three percent of federal spending. Yeah. So even in Washington, twenty-five trillion is a fair amount of money. Um, so how is this is this fixable? I mean, is it realistically can we do anything about that twenty-five trillion dollar shortcoming, or do we just have to run into it? Well, essentially, you, uh, if you're spending more money than you're taking in, you only have a couple of options. You can take in more money or you can spend less. 
uh, to take in more, you'd actually have to take in quite a bit. You'd, you'd have about a 50 percent increase in the payroll tax. It would have to go from it's 12 and a half percent now. It would have to go to about 18 percent. Uh, or the equivalent in other other taxes, of course. And we should recognize that the payroll tax is the largest tax that most families pay. Uh, far more fam- – most families pay more in payroll taxes over the course of a year than in federal income tax. So for all the d- income tax debates we have here is the payroll tax is the big tax. A big increase on that is very regressive, would fall heavily on middle class and lower income people. And you, or else you'd have to find some other way to raise that kind of taxes and transfer the money over, which doesn't seem very realistic. On the cut on the taking it outside or the, the reducing the spending, you'd have to cut Social Security in the future by about a quarter. Uh, and there's lots of ways you can do that. I, I think facing people talk about uh, raising the retirement age or means testing to get really wonky. I favor something that's called changing the wage price indexing formula. Uh, but uh, but there's different ways you can get there. And if you phase it in over time, you can you can minimize the hit. But frankly, young people have been lied to. And one of the first things we can do is face up the fact, look them in the eye and say, yeah, we lied and you're not going to get all the benefits that are promised to you and that's just a fact of life. Do you see this as being a, a thing that could happen? I mean I'm interested in the political realities of this because one really interesting thing about this narrative and I've always thought this about economists from our side so to speak is that I mean, it seems like math. It seems like it would be silly for anyone to deny the realities that you're talking about but we're still – all denying it or a lot of people are. Some people are denying it. Well, and totally. it's, not, it's not just that politicians are denying it or the AARP, which has a constituency, is denying it. But – Paul Krugman. Paul, I mean uh, other qualified economists seem far less concerned than you are. Yeah, well, well, yeah. I think, I think they think it's uh, sort of the low-hanging fruit. Uh, it's certainly nowhere near as uh, bad off as Medicare, let's say, which we're going to talk about in the future. Uh, and they think you can get there by raising taxes on the, on the wealthy or that we'll just deal with it in the future. The, the other answer, of course, is economic growth. Is they, they'll say, well, if we do all these things and it grows the economy – I hate using that phrase, grows the economy. It's if the economy grows. <laughs> if um, the government grows the economy. Carolyn yeah. Baum will beat me up for that. <laughs> uh, so if the economy grows uh, – that, uh, that in that case, there will be more money available and that people in the future will have higher wages and therefore they can afford the higher taxes that will be necessary to support it. Uh, I question whether or not you can get that economic growth when you have the type of debt overhang that we have, that eventually that begins to slow economic growth for a lot of reasons. Businesses anticipate debt as future tax increases and, and therefore they slow their hiring and, and things, things of that nature. Uh, and, and politically, uh, the politics of this have really shifted to some degree. Uh, it used to be a very bipartisan issue that everybody recognized. I mean Bill Clinton uh, at one point supported Social Security reform including uh, personal accounts. Uh, you had a number of Democrats in the Senate like Bob Kerry of Nebraska, John Bro of Louisiana, Charlie Stenholm in Texas who supported Social Security reform very strongly. They're all gone uh, and now you essentially have uh, – Bernie Sanders and even Hillary Clinton talking about the need to increase Social Security benefits uh, rather than to, rather than to cut them back. Who are the constituencies behind this? You mentioned that young people are being lied to and are being told they're going to get benefits they aren't. Are the the voting blocks that would stand in the way of politicians wanting to reform Social Security, especially on the reducing benefits side, are those older people who don't want to see their benefits cut? Are they mostly younger people who are hoping to get their hands on high benefits later? I think it's, in the United States, it's mostly older people. Uh, generally, seniors are – and it's interesting because most of the reform plans that are out there don't involve current seniors. They talk right. about people under the age of 50, for example, making changes. There. Yeah, that was, that was why I was asking because it seems like you could, you could fashion a plan that's like, look, all of you old people yeah. will be dead by the time this kicks <laughs> in. Yeah, and we keep trying to say that to them but, it, but they're very easy to scare. If you're getting a social security check, it's, it's very easy for, you, for them to scare you on this. And, uh, and so there's a lot of kind of demagoguery that goes on around this. You see people being pushed over cliffs and their wheelchairs and all that sort of stuff every time an election comes. Uh, so that's always a big issue. And at the same time, young people just don't vote. Uh, and they certainly don't vote on the social security issue. There's so many things that are more important to them from foreign policy to gay marriage and so on that really animates young people. But it's just not an issue. You know, social security is not one of them. And the likelihood of your voting uh, was, was sort of like the equivalent of your age. About 70 percent of 70-year-olds vote and about 30 percent of 30-year-olds vote. So it's kind of sort of a line in between. And so politicians are always happy to play to the 70-year-olds and not to the, not to the 30-year-olds. 
Uh, one other interesting group, which is why there's some problems on the Republican side with this that really are like Social Security, is actually some folks on the Christian right. Uh, Gary Bauer, for example, in the Family Research Council was against privatizing Social Security uh, because they thought it was too likely to encourage women to enter the labor force uh, if they could have their own accounts rather than rely on their husbands. And wow, that's incredibly disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> not, not surprising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, though, uh, if you look at the constituents, particularly in the Christian right, there's a lot of older women there. And for a lot of these older women, Social Security just found money. I mean, basically, they didn't work back in their generation. And now you, women more likely to pay Social Security taxes today. But for a lot of women in their 70s and 80s, they didn't ever pay into the system. Their, their husband did. And now their husband's dead and this check comes every two weeks. And they just don't want anybody touching it. I, I can understand that. Um, the other two that are the big part of this are Medicare and Medicaid, which come uh, 30 years after Social Security more or less. Um, and you're right to break this down that between these three programs, Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security, that's how much of the U.S. budget? About 48 percent of federal spending is just those three programs. Uh, if you throw in interest on the debt, you're over 50 percent. So. Uh, clearly, you've got to deal with those issues if you're going to going to fix the program. You know, I'm always amused by Republicans who want to sort of balance the budget on the backs of the usual suspects. Well, foreign aid, which Republicans all hate, is one percent of federal spending, and uh, they want to kill Big Bird. Or right now, we're going to defund Planned Parenthood. Uh, well, fine. Uh, Big Bird and Planned Parenthood combined are one ten thousandth of a percent of federal spending. So you're certainly not going to balance the budget on the backs of Big Bird. Would the fourth be defense after the, those three? Well, uh, yeah. In terms of size, yeah. defense, defense and discretionary spending are about the same. They're both around 17 percent. And what does discretionary spending describe? That's everything. Everything uh, else? Everything else essentially. Yeah, the FDA to the FBI, uh, Department of Commerce, Department of Education, essentially all the things that I, I kind of wish would go away. Uh, there, that's that's everything else, and, but it's and frankly, the, they're not all going away. So if so, that there we go. If we just get rid of everything libertarians don't think government should be doing besides entitlements, we've just balanced the budget, and entitlements get paid for. Pretty much, uh, mm -hmm. pretty much. It's sort of a libertarian a, dream, a dream world. But unfortunately, I don't think uh, people are going to go along with eliminating all those things, which puts us back in a bind. Well, it would turn the government to like an old folks' home. Basically. Yeah, the government will make and, and I say we're going to be in a position with, within a half century less. Uh, that we will be – that we will have enough tax money to do exactly that, that those four – essentially those three programs plus interest on debt will consume everything that the federal government does. We may be able to have a little tiny army uh, but that's about it. Hmm. So Medicare and Medicaid, for those who don't know, Medicare is for the elderly and Medicaid is for the poor and they're both part of the same – Act, correct? They were both passed in 1965, although I, I think that's a common sort of misunderstanding. Medicare is clearly for the elderly, although there's a few special things in there for kidney patients, for example, and things like that, regardless of age. Medicaid is interesting because people largely think of it as the program for the poor. And that's why it gets a lot more criticism than people than Medicare, because of course they think it's people taking advantage of it. Uh, but the reality is, even though most of the people on Medicaid are poor. Most of the money spent on Medicaid is actually for elderly people in nursing homes. So this is yet another program that sends basically checks to, to older people. Why? Why is that? Is that I mean, I'm just saying that seems they're hugely expensive. They're nursing home care. If you're going to be in a nursing home for three, four years, and Medicaid is going to pay for so it. Why is Medicaid covering nursing homes and not Medicare? Uh, no good reason that I can think of whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> essentially, I mean, essentially, you have to shelter your income, and uh, you have to pretend to be poor. So you're a senior citizen before do you go in a nursing home. What you do is you transfer all your assets. You let your kids buy your house for a dollar, and you uh, you move, you give a bunch of gifts to relatives and stuff like that. And so you then have no assets to speak of, and then you get Medicaid to pay for it. And there's a whole industry that grows up around this. Uh, right now, there's a there's been a series of radio ads when I come in in the morning and. Uh, on the radio, there's a there's a woman who has a law firm that specializes in doing this, and you know, all these ads. You might think you have to give up your house in order to go into a nursing home on Medicaid. You don't. I will tell you how to shelter your income and stuff. There's a whole industries out there do it devoted to that. So, what is the fiscal situation for Medicare right now? Well, Medicare is much worse off than Social Security. Everybody agrees on that. It's a little bit harder to estimate because, in addition to just the demographics, you also have to figure what will happen to the cost of health care in the future and nobody has a good estimate of that. <clears throat> We've actually been fortunate that for about the last decade, 
the rise in health care costs has moderated somewhat, but no one knows whether that's going to continue or not. And you go to three different government agencies, you get three different guesses as to what's going to happen in the future on that. But even if you use the best case scenario, then the unfunded liabilities in Medicare are about oh, $50 trillion or so. So about twice as bad as Social Security. And if you use more pessimistic numbers, it could, it could be upwards from 80 to $90 trillion. Now, a lot of these uh, accounting things, which I, which I notice in your book, which is something I think worth talking about in the abstract for the how government does accounting when they make these, pro- pro- these, these projections based off of things that will happen or growth rates or uh, laws that will be passed or elimination of three of my favorite words, waste, fraud and abuse. Um, and they just put that into the budget and they say, uh, well, we, we're definitely going to eliminate $500 million of waste, fraud and abuse. So we'll just take, take that off. Uh, how, can you ex- explain a little bit more about how they do this budgeting? And then, and then secondly, can you explain about how they get away with this stuff? Well, essentially, I mean, a CPO actually I think does, is a very good organization and actually does a very good job. But they're very constrained by law that they have to do exactly what Congress tells them. And if Congress tells them, perform your estimates assuming 2 percent growth, then that's what they have to do. Uh, so, so you often get these weird kind of garbage in, garbage out numbers from them. Uh, if you're looking at the budget, uh, what's interesting to do with the CBO is they always produce two budgets. Uh, they produce the budget that they're, they're sort of required to produce. And then they produce something called the alternative fiscal scenario in which they produce, predict what they actually think will happen. <laughs> and that always shows a much bigger deficit and much more problems down the future uh, because Congress will say, assume we don't extend any of the tax extenders this year in the like budget. Like we haven't done for That's past right. we've 10 never, like years. We've, we've we always done. do. And so then they'll produce a budget that shows, oh, the, the deficit went down. And then they'll produce the alternative fiscal scenario that says, but if you didn't, uh, if you did extend those tax extenders, then it will go up. And so you have to look at both numbers, I think, to really get it. And the media, of course, doesn't dive into that kind of depth. They just look at the top line number and say, oh, well, projected budget deficit is going to be lower next year. What's the genesis of that? I'm like, sorry, Aaron. What is the genesis of the alternative budget? I mean, do they just do this on their own or there's a statutory mandate that they do that? Or is I actually some don't know. Sort of the kinds of people who CBO? work at the CBO <laughs> think that sort of thing is fun. Well, I, that, that's probably <laughs> what it is. But the, but the CBO is kind of interesting because it, it, at least according to your book, um, they seem to agree with you in many, many ways about the unsustainability, broadly speaking, of what we currently are in. Oh, sure. And it's been bipartisan. Uh, the, the new director that the Republicans put in, of course, as I said, uh, has, has just said a couple weeks ago that he thinks that we are potentially down the road in line for a Greek-style crisis. But Doug Elmendorf, uh, the previous director of CBO, uh, thought that. And uh, Douglas holtz Eakin, who gave me a very nice blurb for my book uh, that he agrees with what I said. So, so this is something that, uh, that CBO directors have recognized for a long time. It's not just Michael Tanner's wild dreams apparently. I know that I mean reforming Medicare would be rather difficult, often for the same reasons as Social Security, the constituencies and whatnot. But how necessary is Medicare to begin with? Like how many – you know, I mean most of us, all, all of us who aren't on Medicare get health insurance or those of us who do have health insurance get it. We buy it ourselves. We get it through our employer. We could get it other ways. So how many of the senior citizens who are currently getting Medicare through all these transfer payments could afford their health insurance on their own? Well, it's very hard to say. People would have to save for it, which they don't do now. And health insurance has become very different than what it was in 1965 when it essentially was major medical. And that's one of the problems with Medicare is Medicare is almost uh, backwards as insurance would go. The deductibles in Medicare are much lower than they are in traditional insurance. Uh, essentially, uh, you, you, you go to doctors almost for free uh, essentially to get your checkup and all those sort of routine things, which people use a lot, which is why Medicare is very expensive. But if you're actually sick in Medicare, it actually doesn't cover very much. It, it, the longer you're uh, in the hospital, for example, the less Medicare pays. And after 90 days, I believe it is, they, uh, they stop paying. So that's why you have to then go into Medicaid for the long-term care to go into the nursing home because Medicare essentially cuts out. So it's actually kind of reverse from what real insurance uh, would be. Uh, and a lot of it is based in 1965 dealing with what corporate hospital insurance looked like back in, back then when they put it together and it just has, hasn't changed a great deal. Well, that seems to sort of highlight Aaron's question and, and, and your answer seemed to highlight what might be the core of this debate, which is uh, not just whether or not it's unsustainable, uh, which is important, but whether or not the spending is doing anything worthwhile. If you think that it's doing worthwhile things, then you want to figure out a way to keep it going 
budget debt or not, deficit or not. And if you think that it's not doing very worthwhile things, then you not you want to figure out a way to end it. And really, it's just a debate about the the role of government at the end of the day. Well, what's interesting is the constituencies aside. The constituencies all believe it's doing wonderful things for them because they're all getting the goodies from it. But if you actually look at the the sort of Democrat and Republican approaches to this, they're pretty much in agreement that a lot of the spending is not doing anything. There's some very good academic studies, or the, what's called the Dartmouth Atlas study, which looked at uh, how much is spent in various counties around the United States and found there's no difference in health outcomes, even when you medi- no matter how much Medicare pours in in terms of spending, it comes out the same. There's a lot of studies that suggest that Medicare just subsidizes a lot of waste. Uh, so what you actually have is an agreement. If you actually looked at the, the budget proposals by President Obama and Paul Ryan, for example, their goal in terms of future Medicare spending is the same. They have the same projected future grace, which is about 1 percent above GDP. In my opinion is still too high, but interesting that they're the same. The difference is in how they get there. Uh, President Obama essentially wants a top-down approach where he basically wants the government to set prices for doctors. And then he hopes that they set the prices low enough, the doctors will then be the intermediaries and will stop doing stuff and that that sort of rationing will occur and that will reduce costs. Uh, it sort of takes, it takes the blame and, and shifts it to the doctors, which is why doctors hate it. Paul Ryan essentially wants to limit the amount of money that individuals get. Uh, say you can spend that on whatever you want. If you want all the benefits you're getting today though, you're going to have to spend more money which means that people, you know, most, some seniors are going to have to pay a lot more out of pocket than they, than they pay today and essentially do it from the bottom up, if you will, with it. And that's, that's kind of the argument of who's going to, going to make those decisions, whether it's going to be the consumer or some expert at the top and who's qualified to make those decisions better. And that's an interesting debate. It doesn't come across that way in the media. That they're, 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 that's what they're actually debating. Well, interesting, the debate seems to be, at least from the Democrat side, <laughs> Which I'm, I'm, some, I'm somewhat biased, I guess, and to some extent. But any any cut in the current amount of spending or the rate of spending that is occur, that is proposed is synonymous with anarchy. It's, I mean, it often seems to be what the debate is. I mean, this is like the current level of spending is necessary at any given point in time. Often, it's the way Republicans treat military spending. Yeah. Is the way they treat entitlement spending. How can we get anywhere if that's the, so the world way we're talking about this? No, that is that is a problem. It's more of a congressional problem. I say I will get President Obama credit for actually having tried to limit the growth in, in Medicare spending. I don't necessarily agree with him on the way he's going about it. Uh, Congress sort of tried to do this as part of the Affordable Care Act. They created something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board, uh, which essentially takes the responsibility, sort of like the Base Closing Commission. You liken it to military spending. It's the same sort of thing where they created this independent commission that would come up with recommendations for how to save money. And then Congress could veto it, but they couldn't amend it. So essentially both houses of Congress would have to vote no and then they would get rid of it. That I've begins always, in 2018. I've compared, compared those to Congress trying to perform an intervention on of itself. Exactly. If you're an alcoholic, you, you give the bottle to right. to another committee and say, don't even give me any unless, unless I ask. And yeah, They know that they won't cut basically. Well, that, that's right. And uh, the, the problem is going to be uh, we'll see what happens when the rubber hits the road in 2018 when the commission is actually supposed to go into effect. Uh, and it's something that's disliked on a bipartisan basis and uh, you, you see uh, both Democrats and Republicans wanting to repeal this. Uh, and uh, of course, it has a number of problems. I mean, it is going to be sort of a blunt instrument to kind of try and have these a group of experts decide what everyone's health care should be and impose it uh, on one size fits all across the board, which isn't a good approach. But it would reduce Medicare spending if it's if it's imposed. Uh, we'll have to see. I also feel like we should pop in and mention. I mean, there's a there's a moral issue at play here too, in that setting aside Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security are going to older people and by and large, older people are wealthier than younger people. And so we have a system where – I mean you talked about in the – what? In the 1950s, there were 26 working people I think you said. Something like every, that, yeah. yeah. And then now it's down to three. 2.8 2. I think. Um, yeah. per, per but, but those are younger people who are working. Right. Um, and and the, the payroll tax is a regressive tax. It hits lower income people more than higher income people. So what we've got is relatively high, wealthier people with more assets living off the backs of poorer people um, that this could have been fixed. They could have saved. They could pay for their own thing 
and this just seems fundamentally wrong regardless of like the voting blocks, regardless of what the law says. Like there is something wrong about wealthy people living off the backs of the poor and that's precisely what the left is always accusing say capitalism of being. Yeah, I think that that's true and it's, it's true in a couple of ways in, in its immorality. I mean it's a particularly I think insidious form of taxation without representation. You, know, you get to vote yourself benefits paid for by people who aren't even born yet. I mean that – you know that that's a pretty good deal for you but it doesn't seem to be, be something that's morally justifiable in, uh, under any stretch. And second, in terms of redistribution, it's redistribution as you mentioned exactly the wrong way. We use a regressive tax and a benefit formula that benefits high-income people essentially. Combine that with the fact that what you get in say social security benefits or even Medicare to some extent depends on how long you live. If you live to be 100, you're going to get a lot of checks and if you die at 66, you're not going to do so well. Uh, in fact, you die at 64, you don't get anything uh, if you haven't taken your early retirement. And uh, so what you are – and like longevity is linked to income and race uh, in the United States essentially and, and sex, uh, gender. Uh, essentially, rich white women live a long time. Poor black men die early. Uh, so what you have is a system in which actually one out of every three African-American men pays Social Security taxes and then dies before they collect benefits. Uh, you would think that liberals would be up in arms uh, about something that's, that worked that way. Yeah, well, I'm sure that the, the injustices that they're dying early, which is is a very disconcerting fact, that they would like. Sure, we would like, we all like to change. We would that. like yes, everyone to get mini checks for social. Security. I guess I don't know. I don't know what the right <laughs> answer to that question is. So. Um, now, for the last little thing we we've added on to this uh, this trio is Ob Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Um, has that adjusted the the prognostications about the budget in any way? Well, that's going to add significantly to the debt over the long term. Uh, the costs are generally underestimated, and you see some of the numbers that are coming out of CBO. And the, the cost has actually been declining, according to CBO, and that's true for a couple of reasons. One is that not as many people signed up for Obamacare as they thought, so there's fewer subsidies that are out there. If they're ever successful in getting all the people signed up, which is the purpose of the law in the first place. Then, then the, the costs will go up. But right now they're down. A number of states did not expand Medicaid uh, under the program, so they didn't have to spend the money on that. That did bring down the cost from earlier projections, so we should keep that in mind. That said, there's a lot of costs that are off the books on, on, on Obamacare, on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, for example, implementation costs are considered part of the regular budget. They're not a part of the, the ACA appropriations. They're, they're considered uh, authorized but not appropriated funds in Washington speak, which means we're not counting them. Uh, there's a lot of double keeping in the bookkeeping entries where they essentially funnel money through the Medicare trust fund, for example, and extend the life of the trust fund, but then spend the money. And you know, Washington's the only place you can spend the same dollar in two different places and count it both <laughs> times. So, so you have a lot of those sort of bookkeeping games on there. We we estimate that in ten over ten years or so, about, uh, the ACA will cost a little over two point two trillion dollars or so. About a trillion of that is paid for through new taxes, but at least about a trillion two that is going to add to the deficit over the next ten years or so. So the situation is not terribly rosy. Um, we've asked, we've, we've already asked this a couple of times, but you're probably not optimistic, I would imagine. Um, but what can we actually do, or what 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 do you think we should do? And then, secondly, what do you actually think will happen? Well, I think we have to face up to the fact that we are making promises we can't keep and that they're going to have to be changes. And I'm hoping they start the changes sooner rather than later. We actually have a bit of a window. Uh, if you look at just the budget deficit, it has come down. And I think the, you know, there's, there's a lot of argument over who gets the credit for it or that. But it wasn't so long ago. About five years ago, we had a $1.4 trillion deficit. Now we're going to be about $450 billion. I mean, you know, Good is relative. A trillion less is that, that, that's yeah, a lot. That, that, but that, that's a lot of success, and so a lot of that has to do with the sequester that we we put in place. There has to do with the fact that tarps run out and the, the stimulus bills been done and things like that. So some of the spending went away, and we bipartisan basis we sort of held that that down, uh, you know, kicking and screaming all the way. But the but that's only going to last for a couple of years. Uh, according to CBO, the, the budget deficit starts to rise again in about two years, and within ten years, it's back to trillion dollars again. So if we can do something in the next, let's say, four to five years before that deficit really starts to shoot up again, then I think we can ensure a soft landing. If we wait and we have trillion-dollar deficits again and the, uh, the debt has got up to $26, 28000000000000 trillion for, uh, on the books, plus we still have these huge unfunded liabilities, then I think anything we do is going to be very painful 
Uh, and then, then we begin to look more like Greece in terms of the out, you know, not the economy crashing, but in terms of the the pain that's going to be, have to be inflicted. So, given that this podcast is about libertarianism, and we're, I mean, obviously we're stuck in this non-libertarian world, and so most of these reforms that would be proposed are second best at best solutions. But the the first best solution would it be to get rid of these entitlement programs? Entirely. I mean, if we could ma wave a magic wand and just end them, and if we could, how would we address the concerns that these programs exist to address themselves? Like, I mean, how would we, in the absence of social security, deal with old people who might not be able to support themselves in retirement, or deal with poor people who might not be able to afford health care? Yeah, well, I, I think that. These programs were put in place uh, based on the idea that people were myopic, that people would not save and take care of themselves. And I'm not sure that the studies bear that out. I'm not sure that the evidence is there that people wouldn't save if they were given the opportunities. In many ways, Social Security squeezes out savings for those people who need it most. I mean, if you're a minimum wage worker, you have to pay 12.5 percent of your income into Social Security between you and your employer the combined. Uh, that's not leaving you a whole lot of money to save on your own. Maybe you wouldn't save 12.5 percent, but maybe you might save 5 or 6 percent if you were left on your, to your own devices and then we can deal with that. Uh, now, you do, have a, you do have a sort of moral hazard issue. You have to deal with the fact that with the welfare state we have, if you chose not to save for yourself, you could fall back on taxpayers to support you, things like that. So, so it's not as easy as just saying get rid of it. But I, but I do think that in an ideal world, people and their families would be responsible for taking care of themselves. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.